welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Hey everybody, you know, I had a lot of fun with the Paranerds who showed up for our monthly Paranerd party on Zoom a few nights ago. It's just one of the benefits of being a Patreon supporter. A big shout out goes to Bruce Williams, who I think has been to every Paranerd party. He really is the life of the party, by the way. It's also really fun when Melissa Armour shows up, but she couldn't make it this time, and we were really sad. But also a shout out to Tracy King, Michael Henson, and Kevin Gilbert. You just never know what's going to go down and what we're going to talk about. If you want to learn more about how to be a Patreon supporter, you can go to patreon.com slash big seance or click on the link in the show notes. Okay. My guests today are Andrew and Devin, the creators behind Your Best Halloween Ever, which is a seasonal Halloween blog, and they publish daily posts in the fall featuring music playlists, baking recipes, DIY craft projects, costume ideas, original stories, and more. In addition, Andrew is the author of 13 Tales for Halloween, and 13 more tales for Halloween, which can both be found on Amazon. And I'll also link to those in the show notes. We'll talk a little bit about Andrew's books. Devin has a background in the haunt industry, so you can be sure that we're going to touch on that topic as well. Find out more about Andrew and Devin by visiting yourbesthalloweenever.com. If you haven't figured it out yet, I've declared it Halloween season. Pour your tea. I want to welcome Andrew and Devin to the parlor. They are the team behind yourbesthalloweenever.com. And, you know, I just kind of decided the last year or so that when it comes to Halloween and getting into the Halloween spirit, I'm just connecting with all of my buds, my uh, circle of friends of Halloween nerds. And we're I just I'm slowly going to make my way through all of them. And Andrew is is actually been here before. And he reminded me of that. I forgot completely about an episode that we did last May. On Halloween, was it Halloween? Yeah, good old Halloween. Yeah, it was Halloween, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, we should have done a Halloween episode this year, but we didn't." But we're close, although we're much closer to Halloween than Halloween. It feels like Andrew is also an author, and his book Thirteen More Tales for Halloween was just recently published, and so we're definitely going to talk about that a little bit later too. But boys, welcome to the parlor. Thank you so much for having us or having me back. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Devin. Hi, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> because this is an audio medium and we have now three dudes speaking, I'd like each of you to, even though you kind of just did, but each of you to kind of introduce yourself so that the listeners can match voices with names for the rest of the interview. Let's start with Andrew. Yeah. Hey, everybody. My name is Andrew. Like Patrick said, I am one of the dynamic duo behind your best Halloween ever. And really, our goal here is just to help you have your best Halloween ever. Hi, I'm uh, Devin. I'm the other half of your best Halloween ever. I'm more of the kind of photographer and kind of other half of the visual brain. So any photograph you see, or any kind of like imagery for your best Halloween ever, I'm kind of behind there making sure it's streamlined and the lighting looks good and also some of the creative brain behind the color palettes and making sure everything feels always as Halloweeny and spooky and beautiful as it needs to be. Sweet. Andrew, we need to first 
turn to you for this one because this kind of started out as your baby. Where did the idea of your best Halloween ever come from? Yeah, so your best Halloween ever really started as an idea for like a Halloween lifestyle guide. Uh, I have been just a lifelong Halloween enthusiast ever. You know, it was a big thing in my family growing up from, you know, pumpkin patch trips, school parties, things like that. I work in special events, my, my day job. And so I'd had this idea to do almost like a Halloween party guide. Well, having previously independently published a book, I knew kind of what went into that and, you know, the resources to do that well, not to mention not really, who's this guy? I didn't, wouldn't have had an audience at the time. Um, it just, it wasn't feasible. So I took the idea and translated it to, okay, I could do this as a blog and the different chapters of the book could be different daily themes, you know? And, and from there it, I was like, okay, would I really have enough to, to fill this up if I, if I did it this way and we're going on year six. So I think <laughs> the answer is a resounding, yes, there's definitely enough, um, ideas there. And now you could publish a whole anthology or 17 books by the time you're done with it. I mean, it's very, (laughs) it's much more feasible these days than it would have been uh, when the idea first came about, for sure. And so this was, you know, I'm assuming pre-Devon. So what role did the, the magic of Halloween play in bringing each of you together, even not even counting the website? Like, uh, how did this come about? Well, so we've actually been together for a while. Um, we got together towards the end of 2011. So we were together predates the website, but in, in getting to know each other, you know, as, as you know, couples do, we discovered, oh my gosh, we each really love Halloween for very different reasons. And like, that's kind of one of the coolest things about Halloween and, you know, the Halloween folks is there's no wrong way to Halloween and there's room for everybody. So where I fall to the more like magical, whimsical side, you know, Devin has got, and you know, we'll, we'll get there. He, he's he got a great background in, you know, definitely more of like the scary, the gory, the stuff that's going to haunt you. And again, there's, there's no wrong way to Halloween. Devin, what do each of you bring to uh, the site and, and all of your content? So for the website and kind of the content, I definitely, like I said, I bring the eye of like the photography and making sure an image is laid out really beautifully in the perspective of that because my background before having met Andrew was I was a makeup artist slash haunt actor for haunted houses in the local area in St. Louis. So I've worked for the Scream World Parks, the Darkness, Lint Brewery. And what was funny is when me and Andrew met, we both found a like a like I said, a love for Halloween. And we did realize that we came from very different aspects of the Halloween. So Andrew is very much that like nostalgic, cute, wants to bring back your childhood. And I'm the thing that wants to haunt your childhood. <laughs> and we find that that is the balance. So he's always kind of like, how how can you make a home or a space feel really cozy and welcoming? How can you make a party more lively? The creative aspect of that. And I'm always like, let's make sure it's Halloween. And it has that kind of like dark mystery to it or kind of it brings that balance, the duality. So we have a really good breadth of Halloween on the website. And I feel like that creates a really good kind of like non-stagnant moving forward mentality where we can kind of pull different things each time. And we really kind of give ourselves that creative space to like have as much fun as possible, but also never let ourselves get stuck in a very narrow minded perspective, which I love because I love the people that have a really good point of view. But I also think what sets us apart is that we never let ourselves get stuck in that. So we always are trying to bring something new. So that way we can kind of touch a little bit into as many people's Halloween as possible. I love the way you described that. Like um, what I heard was Devin is there to make you seek therapy after you read the article. <laughs> we, well, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll bring something real cute to the table, and he's like, "Let's throw some blood on it." <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I've been to a lot of those haunts in St. Louis, and so it makes me wonder if you know you've ever creeped all up behind me to spook me in you know previous years before we even knew each other. It is very possible. I was there, kind of like in the transitional times where they were creating new pieces, and then. When they opened the Limp Brewery Haunt, I helped kind of open that and kind of did some makeup for that. So 
I kind of have seen a lot over the years, and it was really fun to kind of be a part of people's nightmares for a bit. Now, I want to dig into that more because I know that there are some some nerds listening to this podcast who are going to be incredibly fascinated by that past that you've had, that work. And I guess I'd like to know if you have any either stories you want to share from doing haunted attractions or, you know, like how hard is it? It is probably more difficult than we imagine it is. I think a lot of people think, oh, yay, it's that would be so fun to go work in a haunted house. And it's probably it probably is a lot of effort and a lot of work. It's definitely a mix of like physical and mental exhaustion. So there are nights where you're going to be running around your scene for hours and kind of banging your body into things to make noise and stuff like that. I've lost my voice on several occasions. So I would kind of have to like find ways to make that work and figure out the best voice. Um, I do actually have some very paranormal stories working at the Limp Brewery Haunt because that's in the catacombs down below the old brewery. Oh, I bet. Yeah, there was definitely a night where I sat in my scene and I was in the corner scene. We called it the bar scene. So I had a bar, but then that was also the scene that had the emergency freight elevator. So a working old historic elevator. And I would sit in the alcove and it was dark, so they couldn't see me, but I could see my whole scene. And across the way in the top corner was a motion sensor. And any time that thing would catch motion, a red light would turn on. And one night I'm sitting in my scene in my little enclave with my hands on my lap. And all of a sudden I see my red light turn on. So I get my walkie out and I say, hey, is anybody moving around the haunt or do we have customers walking through? And I got a resounding no. (laughs) And my brain was like, oh, there's something in here with me. So every few minutes or every few seconds, it wasn't consistent. It wasn't a rhythmic turning on and off of the light. It was kind of like it would turn on and then turn off. And a few minutes later, it would turn on again and be on longer and then turn off and then quickly come back on. So I was just sitting there kind of like using a light to let me know I'm not alone. It was wild. I've always wondered exactly what kind of person <laughs> is is able to walk into, you know, like I'm thinking before you even open and everybody's getting it, you know, thank you places, you know, getting to their places and it's creepy as hell and you're by yourself in your corner and the lights and the sound and all of that, like a part of me immediately wants to pee my pants before I even start trying to scare people. And then you add in the history of the limp and the brewery and the energy already that is there in that place when you just throw a haunted attraction into it. I can't imagine just like, okay, time to go to work. I'm walking by myself down to the catacombs. How in the world? Yeah, you. It, it weirdly enough, it just becomes kind of your job, and it becomes like I hate to say it, and it sounds so macabre of me. It becomes your comfort space, like when you when you know the routes and when you know what's in the scenes, and you become so familiar with it, you truly get desensitized, and it becomes your space. So you are the creepiest thing in there. But yes, on those nights where you then find yourself not alone with something you can't see, you are quickly reminded that, yes, this is a haunted house. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andrew, let's let's go back to some therapeutic, nice little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's go. Let's go back to our, our, uh, our whimsical little witch cottage. <laughs> I mean, I think you I, I could probably your aesthetic and the things you talk about and the nostalgia. Um, you are younger than I am, but I think I can, I can very much relate to the image of Halloween that you like to imagine and put together. Talk to me a little bit about, um, I don't know if you want to kind of go more of a nostalgia route or just like, what is the perfect, you know, what is your best Halloween ever? (laughs) Oh gosh. I mean, I, I, I would say that like my best Halloween ever would be just that timeless Halloween. The leaves are red and orange. They're flying through the air. You can hear the wind rustling them around. There's, you know, trick-or-treaters running up and down the block in all kinds of costumes. Porch lights on, you know, bowls of candy, overflowing bags of candy, people shouting trick-or-treat. You know, just that picturesque Halloween that I think we're all trying to achieve. Like, that's kind of the, the feel that I have 
that's almost like the motivator that I have behind everything that we do. Like Devin kind of mentioned it a little bit ago where like we try to keep fun at the center of like why we do this. Like we, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty busy. Like this, it takes a lot to put this on every year. Like we do daily posts starting in mid September running right up to Halloween. Like it takes pretty much almost the whole year to do. And so that driving force really is that element of fun. Like at the core, we're having fun doing this and we love sharing that with everybody. And it's, you know, through that, we want to transport people to that picturesque Halloween of yesteryear. There's a special playing on the TV. In my, in my brain, it's Goosebumps, The Haunted Mask. You may have something else. You know, there's the displays are at the grocery store. The Halloween shops, the costume shops are popping up. Like that's, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of rambling around because there's not one distinct element of it. It just kind of all comes together to, to make that best Halloween ever. Let's talk to people about the whole trove of content years of content that they have. I mean, we've got recipes and playlists and makeup and craft things. Like, tell tell us a little about what's there, what's existing for people to find. Yeah, absolutely. So the year before the idea hit, Devin and I had just a really great Halloween season, to be honest with you. And we just had, we're sharing it on our personal social media. And we had a lot of friends kind of asking, hey, what are you doing for this craft? Because we were, you know, crafting some costume pieces, crafting some decor. I was starting to, you know, starting to try my hand at home baking, things like that. And so that kind of is what sparked the idea of the book, which then became the blog, which then became, okay, when you start breaking down each day of the week, you know, you want to have that like consistent that consistent daily theme, so to speak. So, you know, in my mind, it was like, okay, well, what do we have? There's Halloween music, Halloween recipes. Those can get further broken down into like drinks, bakes and desserts. And then, you know, just kind of a miscellaneous other category. If you go in our archives, you see we have one year we did all six different chilies. One year we did um, a potluck. So various like little finger foods and appetizers. Like my events background is showing there. <laughs> One year we did a, a boo rudge, so it was all like brunch foods with a Halloween spin, you know. And then we had also around that time started doing a tradition with one of our friends, Kratz, who called Project Fallcraft. And so what we did was every year we got together and we had a day where we would watch Hocus Pocus and do a craft and, you know, have chili or various fall food, like pumpkin spice, everything, basically. <laughs> Uh, so then it was a no brainer to include a craft day. Uh, you know, Devin with his makeup background was like perfect fit for costumes. In year two, you know, we started including um, original short stories, which for me was like something I'd never had not occurred to me the first year we did it. And then once it kind of clicked, it was like, well, yeah, that's a no brainer. Like this is, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm getting to, you know, live my best R.L. Stein goosebumps life through my own, my own blog. Like th this is awesome. And so we have all of these like elements and resources, you know, for folks to, you know, check out on our site of, you know, if you're looking for, there's a lot more music out there than just like the Monster Mash and Thriller. Like we've got 35 playlists already. We've got seven more lined up for this year. You know, there's a, there's a lot to dig into there. You know, there's a lot you can do with drinks of, you know, alcoholic or, or non, you know, and then as far as home baking goes, like, it's a lot easier than you think. I, you know, just have some of that that creativity and, and go for it. I love uh, the idea of all the recipes and baking, and because uh, a lot of Halloween for me is smells. Believe it or not, like oh yeah, a smell even in the spring or summer. If I walk, there's something I walk by and I get a particular smell. Boom! It takes me back to Halloween. Like Halloween is one of the biggest nostalgic things for me, and I guess Christmas to some extent too. But Halloween for sure, yeah, is a smell holiday. And you had me at chili because <laughs> chili is was our for the most part. We we had some different Halloweens with different meals, but chili was our traditional meal growing up. That was one of those things. Like it was a great idea. I'm glad we did it. But after that year, like, six weeks of chili, like back to back, <laughs> because it was like we had traditional chili, then like a pizza chili and then a chicken chili. And it was just like we were chilled out for real. <laughs> That's funny. I can totally see that. Well, and it's funny you said about smells, too, because like Devin has this Halloween. Can we have we have a ton of candles, as most Halloween folks do. 
And there is one in particular that like he got it in. I took a whiff and it was full like Finding Nemo, P. Sherman, 42, Wallaby Way, <laughs> Sydney. I was like, this is a candle from my childhood. Like this is Halloween. Evan, help me out. I don't remember what the smell. It's like a pumpkin, but there's like a touch of apple. And then there's like a really strong spice. And it is like, oh, this is special. Set this aside. <laughs> I saw on, it was either Facebook or Instagram, a friend of mine who is, I, I'm guessing probably around your generation, your age. And they did a, a brief little video or a reel of Halloween of my childhood. And it was pieced together like different branding images of commercials or, yeah. you know, movies or costumes. And I found that so fascinating because there were some things in there where I was like, oh, yeah, that is totally my childhood, too. And then I was like, what? I don't even know what that is, you know, because it was a different time for me. So I think it would be interesting if everybody, everybody did a little reel of what their Halloween This was. is Halloween from my childhood. Yeah. I thought it was a, a really great idea. No, I love that. When it's like, I, I have such a specific memory of, and this is a local story here, but like going there, uh, our schnooks down the street <laughs> when, you know, at Halloween time, there was, you know, the spider webs all over everything, the big cardboard cutouts of the universal monsters. And this is probably circa 1992, maybe. And it's just like, it's one of those things, like, it's hard to fully describe the scene, but it's like, that's immediately like when i think my halloween i'm like yep there it is <laughs> i'm remembering back i remember i mean i don't remember what year but there was one year where all of a sudden the thing was for like leaf bags you know like mm -hmm. lawn kind of trash and stuff where they made them all jack-o-lantern style yeah. and so for like a couple of years instead of like blow up pumpkins and blow up things it was everybody <laughs> their leaf oh, yeah. bag uh, with a jack o' lantern on the front. I like. I remember that you're thinking like, "Oh my gosh!" See, I'm all about that because you have it already. So it's yeah. like you don't have to go buy anything but some orange trash bags. <laughs> you know, recycle. Yeah, Devin Andrew had also mentioned uh, your makeup styling again, and and people should know that when you go and look at your all's content, the professional side of your artistry is definitely there on the makeup and it is awesome. So tell us a little bit about like where that came from and, and how do you get such uh, delicious spooky ideas as far as that goes? Oh, so the makeup and kind of where my brain comes from is of course haunt, but I love this question because I get to kind of throw in my interpretation of my Halloween growing up as a kid I have a very specific smell. I love that everybody has a smell that makes them think of Halloween. Mine is the inside of a rubber latex mask. So, oh my God, shut up for real. That's mine. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I love that. I talk about how a roll of duct tape to me yep. smells like Halloween. Absolutely. <laughs> there was one year where my father created me a homemade Sub-Zero costume and he took the bottom corner of a, a milk jug and wrapped it in duct tape to create like the metal looking face guard. So not only is it rubber latex, it is duct tape specifically too, but that smell is such a kind of thing. And there's a very specific mask. If you look at vintage Halloween mask, there's a whole history and collectors behind that. But there's a very specific werewolf mask that my uncle had, and it terrified me as a kid, but I also loved it. So I would always steal it and wear it and run around, but it also scared me whenever he wore it and I couldn't see him and I didn't know it was him. So for me, my brain always remembers that fear, but also the ability for me to become that fear by literally just putting on the mask. So I've always had that mentality with makeup and kind of costuming. So whenever I create looks, I always think about how much fun it would be to be in it. So I always make sure that when I'm creating it, whoever I'm putting it in or however I'm designing it, I want it to be A, comfortable, but also something that really feels transformative. So when you put it on, you no longer feel like yourself. You get to really embody and kind of become whatever you're wearing. Andrew loves this too. He loves a prop and he loves kind of something that he can hold because it's something that modifies your movement. So my professional brain always thinks, how does this affect the way you move? How does it affect the way you feel? 
Can you create a voice for this character? Can you do something within that realm to eliminate as much of you and bring in this new character, entity, creation, whatever it is? So for me, it's always how far can I push the human body to where either A, you're uncomfortable, but not being uncomfortable and everything like that. So I love the idea that you can take something you fear and empower yourself with it and also utilize it to have the most fun you've ever had being something else. Oh my God. I did not expect for you to have me at duct tape. And yeah. I thought I was the only, <laughs> I thought I was the only weirdo. No. Like my job that I just retired from. Congratulations. Thank you. As a music teacher during concert season, believe it or not, I worked with duct tape a lot. You know, you never, you're never taught this in undergrad, you know, that you'll be working with things like this, you know, taping cords and cables and things like that. And every time, you know, I strip off a piece of duct tape, I'm like, Halloween, Uh (laughs) because of the smell. And people are like, what? You are so bizarre. It's not. It's it's so ingrained deeply into my, my childhood psyche. It's that specific smell of that rubber latex. And wearing those masks for so long, your face would get sweaty and sticky and it was fun, but you'd also complain, but you felt so cool because you'd run around and scare people. Like, Uh it is the best feeling just knowing that that smell is something that really you only get at that time of year. Do you also have a theater background, Devin? Because your answer is very theatrical. Oh, yes. Oh, I was a theater kid in high school. And like I said, People don't realize how working in a haunted house is so closely related to theater. Like you hear haunt actors talk about working in haunts and yeah, they're tough and they're gruff and they're there to scare you. But I always say, if you can't scare somebody going through a haunt, make them laugh, make them have some kind of emotional reaction that they can be like, I was at least entertained. So working at the haunt, I would always give myself a character backstory. And our friend Midge, Midge Monster, who just was on, Loves this story and loves when I tell it because my first ever job at a haunt, I was uh, a character in an outhouse. So I would come out of a haunted outhouse and my nickname was Pooh Boy. Oh, it's so crude. I know. Trigger warning. (laughs) Yep. It was on a hayride and I'd come out and I would make like really foul jokes about like go into the bathroom and everything like that. But it was like, I would give myself little lines and things that I could use. So that way, if I didn't scare the person, I would genuinely make them laugh or feel disgusted. So theater is such a big part of haunts and a big part of kind of like what I want to bring into the year best Halloween ever universe is that theatricality and that kind of performance aspect. Behind your backs, secretly, I reached out to some of our Halloween nerd friends. Uh oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and two little birds actually individually told me that you both recently had a strange experience together <laughs> while on vacation and that you might want to talk about this. We did. I'm going to defer to Devin. He tells this story like to, to a perfection. First of all, Devin, you're, you're a little skeptic, right? When it comes to paranormal. Yep. I have to have hard evidence. And the first thing I'm going to do when I have a paranormal experience is I'm going to disprove it. The first thing I want to do is disprove it because I want to believe so much that it is real that if there is even a chance it's fake, I want to know that it's fake. So that way, when I cannot prove it's fake, I cannot deny that it's real. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. So we go on an annual trip up to Minnesota with Andrew's family every year and we rent a lake house. And this lake house is the most unassuming lake house you'd ever seen. It's just a log cabin. It was built sometime, I would say, in like the 80s or 70s. So it's not really that old. And the way it's laid out is you walk in the front door and there's a bit of a hallway. Then you hit the main area where there's like an open space where there's an entrance to a bathroom and a living room. And then you take a step down into a pool table area and a kitchen. And on this step down, there's a little opening. And if you stand there and face the living room and you look to your left, you can see the entrance to the hallway, but you can't see into the hallway. And me and Andrew are standing in the kind of area between the pool table and the living room. And as we're standing there, we both hear a noise from the hallway and we both look to the left and we acknowledge the sound. Andrew's father is in the living room and does not react. Andrew turns to me and goes, why does my mother need your help? 
And I said, I don't know. Let's go look. So we go to the hallway and we go back into the hallway where the bedrooms are and we knock on the door and I say, hey, Kathleen, that's Andrew's mom's name. I said, why did you say my name? Because we both heard my name spoke very clearly. It was like an inquisitive, Devin. And when we knocked, she didn't respond. And it took her a few minutes to come out later. And we asked her then, did you say Devin's name? And she very earnestly and very matter of factly said, no. I was just getting ready. We were about to go on the pontoon. And she very, like, honestly said, no. And so me and Andrew looked at each other like, oh, no. We heard my name said clear as day. And Andrew's dad even said, I didn't hear anything. Like, I saw you guys look. He acknowledged that he saw us look that way, but he was like, I didn't hear anything. And the reason I tell the story that way is if I were to say that we both heard my name and then we looked, People would be like, oh, are you sure you both heard the same thing? But the fact that we both turned our head that direction and Andrew looked at me, acknowledging that the sound was directed towards me, really helped solidify that we both heard my name said at us. And I mean, here's the thing. I can remember it clearly. Like, it was my mom's voice. And it is not out of character for her to be like, do you like these shoes? <laughs> Should I wear this wrap on the boat today? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, she wants to ask our advice sometimes. So I, it was kind of like not out of the realm of possibility that, you know, if she thought I was, you know, outside or whatever, she might call for Devin, you know, Hey, can I get your take on this? And, and like he said, the way that we both immediately turned and I just looked at him and was like, what does she want with you? Just, and then finding out that like, she didn't call his name, but we both definitely heard something. It was like, mm-hmm. ooh. And it's not like there's a history of no ex- paranormal experiences up there. I mean, my, my dad's family has been going up there for since he was, you know, a kid. So there's a lot of like personal history, but there's never been any kind of like paranormal run in or anything. So it it left us a little uh a little freaked out, you might say. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so Devin, what since you're you're the skeptic person and you like to explain things, what were the first things that went through your head for you to try to write it off? So, like I said, the first thing I did was I'm glad we walked right over to the door and immediately knocked. And then, like I said, really confirming with her, like, you did not say my name. And the way that hallway set up, when you go back into there, there's another room just on the other side of the hallway. And Andrew's uh, brother and his brother's girlfriend was in that room. And she said, I heard you guys knock. Why were you knocking? And we said, we, we heard my name said. She goes, I didn't hear your name said. So she really added to that confirmation that nobody else but me and Andrew heard my name said at us. And it wasn't like, it wasn't off in the distance. It wasn't like the voice was coming from in one of the rooms or back in the hallway or quietly. It was a very definitive, Devin, like it was wanting my attention and it wanted me to know to go there for some reason or it was just playing around or it was just something so it was it was definitely one of those moments where i don't know the reasoning behind it i could not figure out why but also i know what i heard and it was one of those ones where i'm not i'm not a performative person i'm not a hyperbolic person i'm not a liar in any sense and i'm not here to like be like oh i heard something was scary So for me to hear that and for me to really be so uh, stern in my belief that I heard it, I'm like, I know something happened weird that day. I don't know why. And I have yet to even prove that it was fake. So in my mind, I heard my voice come from a paranormal place. My, My name come from a paranormal place. And something was trying to get my attention that was not on this human level of realm of existence. I was like, that is wild. Well, because of the fact that this stands out as a story from your vacation, to me, tells me that it's an event that was meant to be important or be remembered. Because if it was just something, I mean, you wouldn't remember it. But um, it also tells me my instincts are that when something like that happens, and I feel like I've had a similar experience when you're like, did it happen out loud or was it in my head or whatever, Um, to me, it doesn't have to be connected to the cabin. You know, it could be just some kind of personal connection meant for the two of you in that moment. Hmm. 
I like that kind of point of view because that does make it feel a little bit more real or to just get your attention to like pay attention to something or look out for something. Yeah. Okay. So outside of Halloween, what's outside of Halloween? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is there any, <laughs> but what kind of nerd are each of you outside of Halloween? If, if it's, if it's even possible to say, well, I am a huge Trekkie. Um, <laughs> I'm also a big fan of the X-Men. Um, yeah. <laughs> you sound like you're working on being proud of, of saying those things. <laughs> no, I, I, I honestly, so I, I, I love that Star Trek is having a renaissance right now because I've been able to get Devin into it because it was such a thing from my childhood. And then, you know, for, for if you know, you know, this past spring, this third season of Picard was basically season eight of Next Generation. I don't think I made it through a single one of those episodes without crying, just from like nostalgia and emotion. And like, and he got it because he was able to like get, you know, came in with all the new shows and is, is right there with me. Um, and then ditto Aww. for the X-Men. Just, I loved him growing up. I'm hoping there's a reboot coming at some point. <laughs> um but yeah, I was a big action figures kid, and so I had all the Star Trek and X-Men action figures. Devin, what kind of nerd are you? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm, of course, like, I'm, I'm like a... Hmm. It's like just a collector nerd. Like, I love the ability to kind of create and curate collections. So I have like a whole Funko Pop collection of not just Halloween figures, but like Disney and kind of different other things. So I love collecting that. And I also love like drag race. So RuPaul's drag race is such a big kind of like staple for me. So I, I love and respect drag. So for me, I'm a big nerd. I, I've watched every season multiple times. I know the elimination orders. I know the background. I keep up with them on social media. So a big drag nerd. And I also love Celine Dion. Like I realized that just a few days ago, I was driving around and I realized I was unironically listening to Celine Dion and feeling every emotion while listening. I was like, I am that Celine Dion person that loves Celine Dion unironically. Yeah, we're going to go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I love that you said that. And you know that there's people listening in our car right now going, preach. <laughs> yes. <soon> as you... <laughs> oh. No, you know what they're saying? They're saying a new day has indeed come. Like... Yes. <laughs> And then they beat their chest real quick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah, big, big nerd. For each of you, what is your most treasured possession? Oh, God. How do you pick? <laughs> the first thing I'll say before we even say what our individual one is, our most treasured possession is wizard, our dog. Oh, so yeah. Duh, obviously. <laughs> oh, yes. And we never introduced wizard. We'll, we'll, oh. we'll lead with that. Wizard is currently sitting on my lap, huddled up and being very, very sweet and uh, precious as he always is. So he appreciates yeah. that then. Yes. Oh, man. That is hard. And it's not hard because I'm like, I, I have to like narrow it down. Like, <laughs> that's why. Right. <laughs> Like, uh, okay, what would so, you grab first in a fire? Oh, my wizard. No, <laughs> besides wizards. <laughs> right. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go with like, what's in front of me here in my office. Um, I have, I, I, blah, I guess it is still Halloween related, but I, I grew up with, you know, the die, the Halloween die cuts in the windows and there's an old bystool witch yeah. in, in an orange cloak, uh, with a, a jack-o'-lantern and she's grinning and she's walking in and I, and I just, I love her to pieces. And the, the original replica, we'll call it, is still at my parents' house, but I have, uh, I think I'm going on three or four versions that I've bought now. Um, I've, I've named her witchy. Um, I would say she's probably... My most prize. Oh shoot! Now I thought of something else. See, this is this is why it's hard. <laughs> That's okay. Or no, yeah. no, no hard rules here. Yeah. Well, do you want do you want to give the the other thing you thought of? Oh yeah yeah yeah. So I have these like they're very niche. They were available. We got them at the St. Louis Zoo, and when I was a kid, they're these little like cloth dolls called animal dreamers, and so it was like a kid and an animal costume and a storybook. 
And I had this little boy with a tiger. I'm looking right at him. I have this little boy with a tiger costume. And there was also in the collection, because, you know, they they put on the back of the box, the other ones, there was a, a dolphin girl. And I always wanted the dolphin girl. And I could never, I never found her. It was, I mean, it was, just, I had never even brought her up to Devin because it was just not something that was in the realm of possibility of finding. Fast forward to last November, one popped up on eBay. And I like went screaming through the house. I was like, Oh my gosh. And then I did a quick, a quick Goog for her book. And there was one copy on like a used book site. And, you know, a week later I had my do- little dolphin girl. Oh, side note, the buy still cutouts. That is, that is my Halloween right there. Yeah. Here, let me grab her. I used to know what year was the ones that I liked. I've seen that. I took, you know what? I don't remember which teacher, but there was always a teacher that had that up in one of my classrooms. I love her. I just <laughs> love her. Yeah. Little witchy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. We are ready, Devin. Um, I'm ready for the most treasured possession here. You're asking somebody who has the most, like, goblin mind ever. Like, everything <laughs> I have found and collected is so precious to me. And I've been sitting here dreading my answer, like, having to... <laughs> Pin it down. He's like, Andrew, keep talking. <laughs> what else can you think of? <laughs> Vamp for me. I need a moment. Um, uh, if I were to, if you were to ask me what's one thing, if you were to strip me of everything and ask me what is one thing, and I'll, I'll make it dark. Let's go there. If you were to ask me one thing that you want held in your hands, in your casket, being put in the ground, ding, ding, we'll go there. I would say, why didn't I ask it that way? Man, <laughs> that's a great way to ask it from now. on. be like, what's the one thing if you were to be buried with? What is the one thing? <laughs> Tell me, what are you being buried with? Yes. What is going to be clutched in your hand when you're buried? Uh, for me, it would have to be. My goodness, this is the hardest question I think I've ever been asked. See, he was ready to go and then he backtracked. He was like, oh, nope, it's not that. It's yeah. <laughs> I'm going to cheat and do two things. Do it. I'm going to do one abstract and one physical thing. I have a very specific crystal that I love. It's a tower. It's a moss agate crystal tower. And it's the thing that got me into crystals and kind of like that. So I love that as my physical. I'll say that that's my one because it feels precious because it is a stone. So it's magical and it has that feeling for me. And then I'm going to cheat. And you're about to really hate me because I foiled your game. The one thing that I want to keep, the one item that I love is my memories from Midsummer Scream. <gasps> You're welcome. I thwarted you. We definitely should have talked about that. I, first of all, was totally jealous that all of my Halloween nerd friends were really having a great time and had so many cool experiences at uh, Midsummer, Midsummer Scream. That's what yeah. it is, right? Yeah, uh-huh. Midsummer Scream. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about it with Midge. But, oh, my gosh, just going on each one of your platforms and seeing all the content and pictures just from that. I'm like, oh, my gosh, heaven. It is the like coolest, most surreal experience, like especially because, you know, you, you meet all these people through like a shared passion, a shared love of Halloween. And then, you know, you're, you're online. Sometimes you, you jump on you know, Zooms or, you know, meetings or whatever, chit chat about stuff. You know, you get, you get to know each other. You really form great friendships. And then you all fly out to the same event and you're there in person. And it's just, it is just the coolest thing just to like chit chat or like, I, I always say that like one of my favorite things that we do when we're there is just, it's the little things like having, being able to have breakfast together in the morning before we go over, run in to grab coffee, like, Chit chatting at night, hanging out, playing games, or even just like the Ubers out there are something else entirely. And that could be a whole other episode. But even just like recounting Uber stories like with each other, it, it's, it's, it really is special. Shopping together. Yes. All like, the shopping I was seeing, I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Going through the mini haunts, like all of that stuff. Yep. Because, like I said, for me, Midsummer is three days of nonstop true memory making. And the coolest thing is, like Andrew said, you get to meet these people online. But then when you're at Midsummer, you get to see them in person. You get to really feel their energy and kind of like get to know them on a true human level and not just what they're presenting on social media. 
So you get to find out their little flaws, the little quirks, the little things that make them so much more interesting. And for me, the most amazing thing is these small businesses, these small shops and these small creators that are only on our little niche side of the internet that we get to find. They're there in person. So we get to meet the creators of so many iconic things like um, I'm going to shout a few people out. It's like uh, Carrie Ann Hudson, uh, Artistry and Design. Lil, the Pumpkin Shop is the sweetest human. And there's so many more creators that you get to meet and you get to put a face to that brand and a vet from Backstitch Bruja. Like there's so many people. And in this space, you get to see them interact and you get to interact and they get to know you and you get to know them. So it creates not only just a much more expansive magical world, then when you come home and you're looking at these, you see it in such a different way and you really get that Halloween feeling. And it's when you leave Midsummer, the memories you get to take and the photographs you look at, it's enough, honestly, to sustain you, not just until Halloween, but through the year until you get back to Midsummer. So to me, Midsummer is now just an extension of Halloween. Like you have Halloween night, but then you have three full days of Midsummer that is, to me, the best Halloween experience because everybody is there so like-minded and so of the mentality that I want to soak up this feeling. So everybody's putting their best foot forward. Everybody's dressed up. Everybody's just there, just genuinely happy to be around other people who have that same love for the exact same thing they're there for too. It is the singular coolest experience ever. Go to Midsummer Screen. Well, and like, it's kind of nice too, because when you're in the like Halloween creator space, like September, October is very busy and things, you know, they finally, you know, slow down probably about a week before Halloween, but going towards like the end of July, it's like, like Devin said, it's that extension of Halloween. You almost get to have like a second Halloween with your Halloween fam. It's that time that you can have to experience it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's exactly, that's exactly it. And mm-hmm. it's, it's honestly, it's just something so special for, to the both of us. And, you know, the, like Devin said, those are memories I, I wouldn't trade for anything. Yeah. It also seems like a way for, a community to support each other and to help each other thrive when, especially when you were talking about a lot of the small businesses that are going there yes, and getting the word out and supporting each other and, you know, each other's content and products and stuff. But honestly, it seems like it would be a little overwhelming too. I mean, is it a little bit of it overwhelming? It does get a touch. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that the first, so that's open Friday night, Saturday and then Sunday. So Friday night, we all like all of our social batteries like like crapped out at the exact same. We were all like, we're done. <laughs> we we're tired. We need to go recharge. Like it is this is this is wonderful. It's amazing to be back. Let's go get a full night of sleep. And then we are gonna hit this so hard tomorrow. <laughs> Especially since I know a lot of you are introverts. <laughs> yeah. We'll bet. We'll bet. <laughs> so and like I said, the thing is with Midsummer Scream. It can get overwhelming, but luckily, the way they have it laid out, there are places within the convention to step away and have a moment. So if the showroom, if the showroom floor ever becomes too much, they have little rooms where they have like museums or cultural kind of um, educational. Like this year, they did a whole like Day of the Dead and that type of culture experience. So you can kind of walk through. It's much more quiet. It's much more like slow paced. And then the panels, you get to step away and do those. So you can make it exactly the experience you want it to be based on your level of overstimulation. So someone like that is more introverted can kind of like take their time and hit the showroom floor a little bit at a time and then step away and go do those rooms or go to a panel. And then somebody who like me, I thrive in that kind of like look at everything it's hard for me to get overstimulated. I think when I get overstimulated, it's more or less, I don't know where to go to next. So I'm like, I want to do everything and I want to split myself into three people. But even then I just tell myself, just keep looking, keep going. So when you see your friend Devin, just walking in a circle and just push him one direction. (laughs) Yep. Just push me and say, you want to go there and I'll go there. And I'm like, cool. I'm happy. So, but yeah, it's, it's a really cool convention that you can kind of like, 
make it your own. And like you said, it is very much a great place to promote yourself, to get to know other people. So it's also like socially, it's incredible for kind of like putting yourself out there. And as long as you like bring stickers of your like self or bring little things that you can give people, because they'll take that back and they'll remember that and they'll start to like talk about you to other people. So it's also like a really great place to promote yourself and kind of put yourself out there. So it's, it's a very, very cool experience. I want to get final thoughts from you guys. And I also want to remind everybody of the website, which is your best Halloween ever.com. Mm-hmm. And then the handle for all of the socials are your best Halloween ever. And that's Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, even Pinterest. And then you also have a Spotify. I'm going to have that linked yeah. in the show notes. But give us your final thoughts and also just what's coming up. And so this is about the time you all are, are revving up. Yeah. So I don't know. Final thoughts. It's just kind of, it, this has just been the coolest thing that we never thought would happen from just a simple idea of, Hey, I wonder if we should do a Halloween vlog. And now it's, you know, we, we've made some of the best friends we've ever had and gotten to travel and, and do such what, like I wrote two books of Halloween short stories. Like that was not something that was part of the plan. And then now here they are. And, and it is just like the like most surreal, best thing I, I've ever done. And tell us more about that book, because I also forgot to circle back and talk about that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So like I said, um, in our second year, we one of our daily themes was uh, Spooky Story Saturday. And I started, um, I just started writing and, and sharing original short stories on the blog. And having always wanted to be like an author and a writer, like one of the scariest things of that is is when you share them with the world and you hope that the characters and the stories that have lived with you for so long find an audience and they find a welcoming a welcoming home um with folks and so from that first year of doing it they were so warmly received it was just again it was just surreal in the best way possible um you know i had a couple i I, have to interject really quick and say when andrew writes a story he captures the halloween magic in such a way Several of his stories have made me fully cry because they evoked <laughs> such an emotion of my childhood Halloween that I could not contain it. If that gives you a hint of how well he writes that Halloween magic, brace yourselves because sometimes you'll find yourself feeling emotions that you did not expect to feel reading that story. Wow. As- especially of a Halloween story. Like I-, I don't I don't necessarily set out trying to, you know hit the emotional one twos, but sometimes it just happens. You hit, you hit that, that sweet spot of like nostalgia and magic. And then the next thing you know, it's, it's, it's underway, but yeah, so they were very well received. Obviously I, I did another batch, uh, the next year and you start looking around, people were asking like, where can I buy these? I'd love to have these in a book. And it's like, okay, yeah, probably someday. And then it hit me like, okay, well I have 12. If I would do like a bonus 13th, I could do a book. And so in 2021, that's where 13 Tales for Halloween came about. And during that time, we were con- I was continuing to write more stories on the site. And again, this, this past July, uh, I had found myself with 12, wrote another bonus story. 13 more Tales for Halloween uh, came about. And for somebody who always... I grew up reading Goosebumps. Any series I could get my hands on, I yeah. loved, especially the Goosebumps books. So to now have essentially my own series is just like full tilt, like life dream moment come to fruition. Even even just today when we were kind of getting ready for this, I, I pulled a couple copies off the shelf and I was just like, hey, remember that time I wrote a book series of Halloween short stories? And Devin was like, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, thir- 13 Tales for Halloween, 13 more Tales for Halloween, um, my little babies. And if, if you check them out, I, I hope you love them as much as I love writing them. And have you always wanted to be a writer or did Halloween lead you to wanting to write those books? Oh, I from before I could even write, I was, di- you know, I would I would draw pictures and tell my parents what I wanted to, to say on the page and I would make them write it down and staple down the sides of the paper and make my own little <laughs> storybooks. You know, I, 
looking back at any like grade school, what do I want to be when I grow up? I, I want to be a published author, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to write books. Like, I think at one point, if we, if we could bottle the ambition and drive that we had as kids, I think at one point I literally wrote Scholastic a letter saying that I too should write scary chapter books for kids because who understands that better than kids if there's kids writing it? Um, and then obviously now knowing the nuances and everything that goes into all of that. But yeah, that was just something that I kind of pursued, you know, hit continued writing, continued reading all through school, and then just have you know pursued it as a, a side hobby. And just hearing that these stories and these characters and the, these moments that I, I've written and managed to capture have resonated so much with people. It's like, okay, if we finished, you know, if, if we decided to wrap your best Halloween ever, like today, I'm proud of what we've done, but I'm especially proud of these books. Awesome. I published a book in third grade in Miss Soniker's class. Yeah. And you can find it at the bottom of a Rubbermaid in my closet. <laughs> I think it was called Sally in the Museum. Oh, my gosh. I don't know why it was Sally, but Miss Sally went to the museum. I bet she had a time. <laughs> she did. She found a really nice picture of a cornfield that she liked. And that's all I remember. There you go. <laughs> See, there, Halloween, fall, cornfield, it all ties together. Yep. Devin, final thoughts? Ooh. So for me, your best Halloween ever is just continuing to do its thing and bring magic. We did change something for this coming year. I'll kind of throw that out there. More or less, my creative brain has kind of been a little bit tapped on creating costumed looks so this year, you'll notice that there isn't going to be a costume trunk Thursday. We have replaced it with um, a different theme for Thursdays that we're very excited. It's a little bit more playful, I'll say. That's a good word for it. So it's going to be a different kind of approach. That way, I've been able to really creatively put my brain towards the photography and the lighting aspect of our pictures and the way we're presenting the imagery for the blog. You'll kind of notice that it feels a little bit more professional, a little bit more high end. I really wanted to take that approach to be more invested in the overall look of the blog. So I put that time towards that. And just moving forward for Halloween, I think I want to give more grace to Halloween. I think a lot of us always talk about how we put so much time and energy into it. And then when the night comes, it's always like, well, what do we do with it? So I think I this year just want to be able to fully relax on that day and watch like a spooky movie and just chill and enjoy the glow of Halloween and that warm feeling. So for me, everything we do is to have your best Halloween ever and everybody's Halloween looks different. So I'm always excited when I hear people saying our blog or our creative content that we put out helps them have their best Halloween ever as tacky as that sounds. It is so cool to hear them use that phrase, ironically and unironically, to have the best Halloween that they could have. And so I love that. So last year we did all Halloweenified other holidays and seasons. We had Creepy Christmas, Halloween, Spooky Spring, stuff like that. Uh, so this season, year six, we are all Halloween all the time. So to keep up with uh, our daily posts that start in mid-September, check out, we have a newsletter called The Daily Boo. Uh, you can sign up uh, on our website. Uh, you will get a daily email. We always get a few folks that come back and say, wow, that's a lot. But it's, you know, we, we do post daily. We put a lot into it. And it is in the title, The Daily Boo. Uh, so uh, do sign up for that. Uh, you'll get all the posts delivered right to your inbox. Um, like I said, Halloween is back full force, your best Halloween ever. And we are so excited. Uh, gearing up for year six. Beautiful. Andrew and Devin, happy Halloween season. And you rock. Yeah, happy Halloween. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much for having us on. Happy Halloween. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit bigseance.com. And you can continue the discussion and hang out with a great community of paranerds by joining us in the Big Seance Parlor on Facebook. Want to hear your voice in a future episode? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out. But we'll see you and light them again next time.
thank you to the following super pair nerds who support this show at patreon.com slash big seance. Michael Henson, Daryl, Anne-Marie Sullivan, Natalie N., Kim Robb, Joe C.L. Lorenzo, and Susan Davey. My supporters at the parlor guest level, who can be found at bigseance.com slash parlor guests, are Ali of Hocus Pocus Collector, Ann Rekovich from ozparatech.com, Dina DeCastro of Dina DeCastro Astrology, Janae Michaels from Greyhouse Tarot and Farm Artifacts, Amy Park Gedicke of amyparkg.com, Lonnie Scott from weirdwebradio.com, Lena and John of Carbon Lilies, Midge Munster from midgemunster.com, Diane Razmataz, Tracy King, Andrew Watson, Christine Rath Selhi, Mindy Kintop, Hope Battaglia, Casson Bailey, Melissa Armour, Bruce Williams, Christopher Kohler, Janet Shaw Bins, and Amy Taylor. And I currently have four awesome listeners who support this show at the $10 level, which, as you know, isn't even a thing. Those awesome pair nerds are Glenna Becker, Steve Skinner, James Wilfong, and Peggy Hagen. Want to know what's even better than the completely made up $10 level? The completely made up $20 level, which includes awesome listener pair nerds like Jean Marie, Kevin Gilbert, and Norman and Linda Keller. Thank you, Paranerds.